So hey, basics of digital painting. What we do here every week is I look over all of the submissions that have been made for the previous week for the previous homework. And then at the end of the class, I give a new assignment and upload an image to the homework channel and you guys get a chance. You get one week to follow the homework and submit it uh, for a chance to have your work reviewed the next week. Uh, over the course of the last like six weeks or so, we've been seeing a lot of repeat people come in, do the assignments and just learn and grow. It's been really wholesome and it's free. So if you see us here on YouTube, feel free to pop into the, to the Discord here and join us, discord.gg slash Huckleberry. Tell your friends. Can't hear anything either. Muted his mic. What? No way am I muted. Okay, I'm leaving and coming back. This is staying in the VOD. We're gonna be right back. How about now? Yes? Okay. Yeah, it was just a Discord thing. I transferred over from one of the voice chat rooms. And because I transferred over from the voice chat room, it just decided to leave my soul in the other chat. Classic Discord behavior. Okay. So the VOD heard what I was saying. <laughs> Yeah. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, great to see y'all again. Let's get started on this thing right away. Uh, the way this works is that if you see your artwork up on the screen, you are welcome to raise your hand. You can pop on stage with me and we could chit chat a little bit about your work to get some live feedback. If you don't want to go over voice, you can do it over the text chat also. Either way is good. We've got uh, St. Ed's the first one and he's up here. Hello. How's it going? Hey, St. Ed, can you hear me? Yeah, yep, yep, I can hear you. Can How's you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. How's it going? Uh, I'm good. What about you? I'm good. Uh, so I pulled yours up first because you were really thorough about documenting your process. And I just, I did this, I did this study this week too. And oh. I did something really similar to what you're doing here. And so I wanted to show this oh. first to, in case it's going to inform me the future discussion here. Um, with this crazy pose... Let me pull up the original reference here. Um, with this crazy pose, it's uh, I found like it didn't feel like a viable choice to try to figure out what all the angles of everything was because the figure becomes so abstract when you break it down like that that I immediately reached to the same tool that you did, which is to try to actually figure out where is the body underneath here and what is the perspective of all the different limbs because then we start to get this structure that's going to be easier to like figure out where everything is. What was your experience with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I had like the same idea because I, my main concern was that if I wasn't gonna do that, I would be basically just replicating the shapes and visuals, mm -hmm. and I wanted to actually get some experience with foreshortening and anatomy as well. I, I figured it was a nice idea. Yeah, and what's what I found was really interesting was I you know there's this extremely abstract pose this week. And so I figured we were going to be getting all kinds of crazy pinwheel distortions, people having the bodies all screwed up. But the consistency this week was through the roof. Like I thought that people's proportions and consistency were really strong this time. And I wonder if it's because like the pose is so uh, out of the ordinary that people like, you know, were extra diligent about it. This kind of forced everybody to like be a little extra diligent. So could be, you got a nice little, you got a nice loose drawing going. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of structural things that look like they're off. Like maybe the rear arm looks like it's pulled up a little high to me, but you're in. Yeah. I think I, Fixed it a little bit. Yep. I moved it, I think. Yep. And he pulled it back down. Yeah. And started adding some of the detail and rendering. And uh, your your text here said he spent about three hours on it. Uh, yep. Um, but, you're, uh, but you're not satisfied yet. You haven't gotten satisfaction after three hours. Uh, 
I, I'm generally happy with it, uh, but I think uh, mm, there is a few things that I like didn't nail as much as I wish I did. I would have. Uh, the translucency of the fabric is one of them, um, and the other thing is uh, uh, like on the back. I, I feel like I have way too much contrast. I noticed uh, in in the photo later uh, and as well. Uh, it, as in other people's submissions that it's more like flat mm -hmm. and I have um, kind of like a shadow a band uh, right around the sh shoulder and I didn't really like that. Um, well, so th wanted, those are things. I wanted to raise the translucency thing first because this is something that I think is really noticeable element in this, in, um, in this reference. Uh, on the original reference, we've got um, looking at that area where you can kind of see through the jacket uh, and be able to see the leg behind it. You know, you stuck really close to that edge right there. But I think one of the things that stands out to me, when we take away all the color and everything, one of the main features we're left with are the edges. And uh, I talked about this a little bit last week, but I find that it's really important to be able to choose whether or not you're doing a like um, like a, a really hard edge, you know, a really soft edge, or like something in between. And I, I've kind of wanted to experiment to see how many different levels of edge do we need in order to, to feel like we've got enough to really like work over the whole thing. Is it five levels of like hard to soft? Is it 10? Is it 20? Um, and I think like in this case, you've got this like razor edge going along here. And I think one of the things that would really help feel more translucent is to just lose a little bit of that. Just softening that up I a see. little bit like this, because if we're going to be seen through it, you know, we're there's a, there's a couple of points that would help with the translucency. One of them is that, where there's a where the jacket goes at a glancing angle, it ends up going a little bit more opaque. And so we end up with these like darker areas of contrast, but none of it actually forms a particularly hard edge here. You can see it's this nice, smooth, soft, as we like looking through this area here, this mm -hmm. little dip here, it's this nice, smooth, soft, you know, gradient that, that goes through that dip. And so it's like, I, I personally don't like to use soft brushes for this kind of stuff, but it's I, instead I, I prefer to like use something where I can kind of go back and forth and smooth it out and find where it's going to be. And um, it, it stands out because of the contrast, but I think if we're just paying attention to the edges, we're going to, you're going to see that it's going to, it's going to kind of softly smooth out as it goes down into the bottom of that, that dip. And it's going to get pretty light in there. And then it's going to, you know, get really dark again. But it's going to be this, like, smooth transition back and forth. And uh, as we're seeing it, like, anything that's translucent rather than transparent, we're always going to see a certain amount of blurring happening. And I think that's one of the key visual properties that helps us really see that it's, like, this sort of semi-transparent, translucent material is that it's going to to get kind of blurred as we're looking at it. You see what I mean? Oh yeah, I do. Uh, also, something that I just realized uh, is that, um, like, when I, when considering values for this, it seems like the translucent fabric has a lot more contrast. Mm-hmm. Uh, it like it gets lighter, and I think if I would have picked up on this, maybe I would have had more uh, success. I don't know. Maybe um, there's something I, I noticed when I was working on this that I, I thought was kind of interesting, also because you have this lighter area from the translucency on the fabric, but then you also end up with these light areas that's like light glancing and bouncing off the outside of the fabric. So we have it getting light from going through the interior, like all passing through it. But then we also have it going light from bouncing off of it. And the two areas are relatively close together. 
And the difference between them is that edge hardness because we see there's a really tight, stiff edge on these areas where the light is bouncing off just the rim of the fabric versus the areas where it's passing through it and it's and it's kind of glowing and diffusing as it's as it's passing through it. And so if we stand back just a little bit, I think it becomes uh, more clear that like it's it, it's all about the fall off, all about the edges that show us the difference between the elements in this pattern. Um, it it does get a little looser and tighter as it, as we go up and down this fold here, but then it's in contrast to like the seam and then that rim light that those end up being a lot tighter in their shape, and that ends up really like establishing a lot of the look of the material. Oh yeah, I see. Do you have any questions? I, I thought it was fun that you had the throwing the ball thing because you had the little orb for to help out with the lighting direction here, and then now he's just like yeah. fucking it off the side. I thought it was cool. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, um, I don't think I have any questions. Um, okay. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's just a great study material. It was very fun. Good. Even though it was it was very challenging, like there is no denying. Um, but I think it was good. Good, great. I'm glad you had fun. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, uh, thank you. All right. So up next, we've got Dingle Food. This one took a lot longer than I expected, is what Dingle said. You said it took a lot longer than you expected, but Dingle Food was also the first one to get their study done. I don't think I see them here in chat. It's always hard to tell with these borders make things a little tough. Um, uh, Dingle Food, I, I, you know, I thought got a lot of the body proportion really well uh, done well on this. Like it even like just about everybody, I think, did a pretty good job overall getting the pose of this guy just right. I really expected it to be a big challenge, and yet it seemed like everyone had a, a little bit of an easy time with it. Like the the peculiarity of it forcing us all to consider the structure a little bit more. But the place where I think it starts to fall apart a little bit is in the face, and I you know the opposite is true here. We like feel like we know what the face is supposed to look like. We feel we have shortcuts for how we're supposed to draw a face. And so when the when Dingle Food gets to the face here, I think it ends up um, feeling a little bit like he's making shortcuts that uh, are based off of his presumptions about where everything is. And, uh, you know, simplifying out the face in a way that starts to cause it to drift away from the reference. And uh, we even, I think, lose the proportion a little bit, like the head is starting to feel a little large and it's uh and the perspective on it seems to be uh changing a little bit the biggest feature that is like it looks like the nose has gotten quite a bit shorter like if we see this the nose and the position of the mouth are just further down this way on the original like they need to get pushed down this direction why am I? Why is nothing visible? Oh, I'm on eraser. So the mouth and the nose just need to get pushed down and to the left a little bit, I think. Um, and the way that I was able to get this going, to, to get this relatively right, is I think it's it just like we were seeing um, on the previous example of breaking things down into a geometric form, I would definitely start with looking at the geometry of the head in preparation for figuring out where the features are going to be and just trying to be really clear about where those biggest shapes are because you're going to find where something big like the mouth and nose being off, you're going to notice that when you start to abstract it out and boil it down into its more simple geometry, same thing with the hair kind of flying up and off like this. I think that all of that starts to become a little bit more clear when we break away from looking at the these things as what they represent, you know, a face, a hand, 
and start looking at it as more like an abstract octopus made out of human limbs, which is kind of what this image looks like. So that would be my recommendation to you, Dingle Food, is to, when you start to feel like things are off, take a step back, bring it back to its like broader geometry, um, and try to repeat the same process with the face that you had success with here with a lot of the body. All right, so we're going to move on. Abarth. Oop. You want to hit that button again? Oh, wait, you got brought up. Hello. I think it worked. There you Hi. Go. How's it going? It's going great. How are you doing? Doing really good. So uh, this is a perfect opportunity to fo follow up on last week. I had given you some feedback about how if you feel like you're having trouble on the final details, it might not be the details that are a problem. It might be the earlier value stages that were getting you in a, in, in a tough spot. And so you said this week you gave it a try. Yeah, I, I, I try to do it. I, I think I said in the comment, I tried to shrink down the reference really tiny mm -hmm. so that I couldn't see any of the details in it. And then I tried to use basically the navigator to try to make it make it look look like the reference there before I went into any of the details. How do you feel like that process worked for you? Um, I think it, it was sort of emotionally hard to stay in that middle stage because to me, the painting looks sort of ugly and I wanted to get to the point where I was making it look, look pretty. But then by the time I got to the details, it was, it seemed like it was way easier at that point. Ah, I think you've hit the heart of it here. It's like, it's not that it's diff more difficult to do it this way because it's like harder on like your brain or like you need to scale up and like grow a stronger, you know, frontal lobe or whatever. It's just like. You, you find that there's like a process in, in your mind that works against you, that you're like, you're, you want to rush ahead and you have to like be disciplined. And it's that discipline that ultimately like actually, rather than like giving you elevated strength, it actually just brings the difficulty of like the future steps down. So it's like, instead of you growing stronger, it's like you stay the same and the, the task becomes easier as a result of like, using these tools and like being more disciplined about it, which I find is generally pretty true. There's a lot of skills where you will just get stronger and you will get better at them and you'll be able to overcome them. But there is a huge portion of this, which is figuring out ways of making the task at hand, like just a lower bar to cross. And this is, this was really at the heart of my recommendation. And so I'm very happy to hear that, like you've understood it and that it worked for you. Um, it's it's great it, because now you're you could apply the same lesson across basically everything else that you're doing going forwards. Yeah, I felt good. I'm I'm looking forward to doing doing this week's study and trying trying it again. Great. Um, did was there anything in particular that you were having trouble with that you'd like some feedback on? Um, I felt like I I wrestled with the folds uh, in the cloth. Mm -hmm. Because I, for many other shapes, I sort of just wanted to replicate what the reference had, mm -hmm. but I sort of didn't like the result when I tried that with the folds because there's just so much detail and stuff in the folds I didn't I didn't really want, and so I felt I was trying to invent new folds. But I know there's like whatever it is, the seven spiral folds and half locks or whatever. I just don't yeah. I don't know them, so I felt like I I need more I want more vocabulary there so I could invent something better there. Uh, yeah, I mean, my dark secret is that I don't actually have them memorized either. Uh, w when it comes to something like this, my strategy for it is to um, zoom in and treat it to a, a little bit more of an abstract way. Um, you know, there is a certain if you look at an area like this, there's a certain amount of it, which is basically just a kind of a matrix of edges where it's like some of them are hard, some of them are soft. And it's like, if you can spot the, I mean, in your drawing, you have identified some key edges that you wanna follow, like this really dark one here, right? And in the, uh, in the reference, this comes, it has this very hard edge that calls out uh, and, and really like draws attention to itself, right? Um, and so if you can find, if you have like the rough look of the values established and you kind of know where the edge is and you know what hardness the edge is, then you kind of have all the information you need 
to be able to to build this structure without actually having a total understanding as to what you're looking at. Um, the more you have a like an an academic understanding of like what the light is doing and why, the stronger it'll be. But there's always going to be some portion of it which is ultimately abstract. And with really like complicated folds like this, where we're not looking at anatomy, something that's going to be recognizable to the human eye as being like very needing to be very precise to to be like recognized as being correct. Like it's a lot more about the kind of um, tempo of it. It's this rhythm of folds, uh, the rhythm of the edges and transitions. So what I mean by that is like we're we can find a couple of edges here which are um, there's some of them that are going to be like razor sharp, some of them that are going to be pretty sharp but maybe a little softened. Some of them are going to be like the area through here. We have this kind of pattern of of like middle grays that's all very soft and soupy, all inside of itself. And then like you know, it kind of softly moves up here with a fold in the middle that ends up being a little bit tighter. And so it's like just looking at this as like every transition, like if we're imagining what – just looking at like over the length of this bit of fabric, how much darker or lighter does it get? It looks like it gets like half a shade darker over the length of it, just maybe 5%. And so sometimes we're, we're seeing these like really – small transitions of light to dark while other areas are getting are crossing that boundary in like a single pixel and if you can break them down once you've got it like this and you have the general structure just going through it edge by edge finding the places where they are incorrect making sure to carve in the hard ones smooth out the soft ones uh, all of the rush, rough brush strokes that you have here very quickly become like a useful foundation to build a much more detailed painting on top of without having to like hold a mental model over the three-dimensional structure of everything in your mind simultaneously. Because trying to understand the geometry of every fold in here and how it's interfacing with the light is impossible. There, there was like these broad rules, these broad heuristics that we're able to do but beyond, but there is a limit to the amount of brain power we're able to dedicate to this task. And so at a certain point, we need to focus on kind of just one job. And with a black and white image, this is even easier because, um, you know, you don't end up needing to, to take it to color. You're, you're just needing to focus on the values and edges and, and you're able to, to build it up like that. And you could see that, um, you know, if you, as you build up like a stronger confidence with your mark making, the process of turning this from uh, this level of sharpness to something that is more in line with what you're doing on the face, it can get pretty fast. Even if you're doing everything in a very manual way and just trying to go through the whole thing is like a big shopping list of like, now we need to do this this little bit of light, now we need to do this little bit of darkness, figure out what how soft or hard it is on this side, where does it end? How fast does it cut off? And just going through that whole long list of little folds. If you get in the flow with it, you can bust it out in a few minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. Are you thinking about the, hmm? are you thinking about the sort of edges and shapes separately? Or are you, you thinking about them together? Um, I don't know. I feel like they, they're sort of sounding like you're talking about going, going through the edges and oh, sorry. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm seeing the shape and sometimes I feel like I'm seeing the, the edge. I mean, they are kind of both part of the same thing. Cause it's like, um, you know, if we have this dark triangle here, you could see it as like one solid filled in shape, but it also terminates on one side with like a bit of a softer edge as it, you know, rounds this little hill here. So I think I end up seeing more in terms of the edges and the transition of edges um, than I do as like blocks of value. 
because like I think it's a I think a lot of what makes things look painterly is like these subtle transitions. Um, the thing that's that's interesting and complicated about looking at the work as a at looking at the image as like a sort of series of of transitions and edges is that they're kind of overlaid on top of each other. Um, the blurring your eyes as as you were doing like looking at stuff at a distance, when you get really zoomed out, you'll notice that there will be really big, soft transitions like the bottom of this part of the jacket ends up being a little lighter while the top part up here is a little darker. It's kind of darker through the core. And um, but then we also have these like smaller bits where it's like, you know, just running along this, the edge of this seam here, it gets a little bit lighter and it's difficult to come to abs uh, understanding of it in absolutes. Like we're not thinking about this in terms of like it's 60% gray versus 65% gray versus 85%. It's like we're looking at the image and we're saying, is this a little bit lighter? Is it a little darker? Is it a little sharper? Is it a little, is it a little softer? And just intuitively pushing everything around based off of what our perception of the reference is. I think one of the upsides of, of approaching it this way is that our biases will uh, allow us to get it wrong in interesting ways, and that will help produce our personal style. So while the goal is to try to reproduce it as best as possible, I think the thing that uh, is ultimately going to give it the most punch is the places where you get it wrong in ways that are kind of internally consistent for your own mind. You know, the, the biases and like misperceptions that you have that are like are consistent are, are going to lead to you having like um, creating an overall like stylized painterly look, which is unique to you, become like a fingerprint. Oh, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Great. Uh, well, thanks so much for joining us again. Yeah, thank you. Good to talk to you. All right, moving on. We got Silver Eyed. Silver Eyed here? All right. I brought, I, I, I pulled Silver, Silver Eyed's submission uh, saying this was a challenge, but it was fun. Working with big shapes helped me a lot uh, get more comfortable, and I'm quite happy with the end result. Um, I think this is a, I, I they also uh, posted where, um, they started with uh, what they were talking about, the big shapes. And I think this transitions nicely from the conversation I was just having with Abarth about like blocks of color versus edges. Um, looking, trying to work out the image as a series of blocks of color, uh, especially up front, I find to be particularly challenging. And I think that in this case, I think it worked against Silver Eyes here. Uh, silver eyed. Uh, it's really, really tough to make sure that like all your blobs are the right size. And that like, if we're trying to figure out how big is this blob supposed to be compared to like this blob? Well, we don't have an intuitive understanding of blobs versus blobs. We have more intuitive understandings of like heads versus arms versus feet. And um, I think for us to get to the point where we're starting to look at blobs of color in abstract, at first, I think we need to always start with structure. Uh, like I was showing at the beginning of the class with the, the example from, uh, from Sened with the, uh, the geometric structure underneath to, to build the perspective, that is going to help really establish a, like a uh, – uh, what do you call that when they build the scaffolding to be able to build the rest of the painting from and that having that scaffolding to kind of contain it is going to go a long way i would i think that this strategy of laying out these blocks of color and then uh rendering them down is a good second step but i oh hey silver eyed you are here but I think that going, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to come on stage and chit chat. One day I'll build up the courage to come on stage. Well, okay, whenever you want to. Um, I think that this is an excellent place to start for a second step, 
But I think that starting here ended up putting you at a little bit of a disadvantage as far as finding the structure of the of the overall figure. And so if you can um, take a little time at the beginning to lay out uh, the like a wireframe of where all the body parts are going to be and how they're overlapping and what their proportions are, that will give you uh, uh, the information you need to then put in these blobs of color. And from there, I think you're going to end up with all the information you need to be able to start adding details. So much of this is about breaking these problems down into discrete pieces, solving them separately, and then reassembling them. So it's like we're not going to grow a brain that's 10 times the size. It's about looking at this very complex problem, breaking it down into pieces that we feel are addressable, that are easy. And then uh, when we put them all together, they kind of like weave together to form this painting, which we cannot even conceive of ourselves that we made, you know, standing back and looking at the work. I, I find that I'm always surprised that I could even make a painting because there's so many little, so many thousands of little complex decisions that make it up. And my brain is just too tiny to hold them all in. And so uh, breaking this down in a more diligent way is going to end up giving a, a much stronger result. Uh, and I, I look forward to seeing if you want to try that out in the future. We'll take a look at it. Uh, this next week assignment, uh, we're going to be doing landscapes, so it's not going to be applicable to figures like this. But next time we do a figure, uh, feel free to like flag it and say, hey, I've tried that thing out. It either worked for you or didn't work. We'll take a look at it together and see how it goes. All right. So thanks so much for submitting this week. It's great to see you working on so hard on this. Um, Trisegion is the next one who's up. First homework submission. Uh, enjoyed the process of figuring out how I wanted to approach each element. Ended up messing around. Oh, he's going to come up there or they're going to come on stage. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. How are, how are you? How was the assignment for you this week? Uh, I really liked it. I thought it was uh, really fun to um, really focus on like trying to, I guess, understand the uh, the lighting, the uh, like you mentioned earlier, the translucency versus like the light hitting the surface itself and like uh, just rendering all that out. Yeah, when it's all black and white, you get a chance to a little bit more leeway to focus on this. So, how about how long did you spend working on this study? Um, I probably like maybe eight hours. I was uh, doing it for a few hours for a couple of days. Wow! Yeah, I can definitely tell you put a lot of work in on this. It's got a. I, I just. You know, not only do we see the final polish here, but they've still got remnants of the original structure that you're putting in. And looking at some of these areas, like uh, even some of these side areas, like this shoe, I can just see you've got a lot of brush strokes building it up and a lot of decisions, a lot of little revisions. And I, I always think that when you can see that work on the page, it's really appealing. And yeah. it, it's, it's a... Uh, I can see you really pushing yourself to try to do this as best as possible. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm taking a close look at your uh, brushwork here. Are you using some kind of smudge tool or something on the face? Uh, no, uh, it is just straight brush strokes. I wanted to like not use smudge tools this time. Okay, just but you, you've used them in the past? Yeah, I usually do to like render stuff out, but I'm just like, I want to... Oh, just try painting straight. Yeah, I, I've always had a hard time getting the appropriate results with a, something like a smudge tool. Like I'm seeing this um, thin line here going down the, the front of the face, the along the cheek here. And mm -hmm. to me, this it it it's running the same direction as some of these other brush strokes. So I was wondering if maybe there was like a, a dark bit up here that when you were trying to do this rendering that it kind of got smeared down the edge and made this like um, this hard line. Mm. And like, it's those little, you know, it's, there's a couple of tool marks here that remind me of something that looks a little smudgy. And it's, mm. it's not necessarily that it's a problem. Like I think having tool marks can be quite appealing to look at. It's more a matter of like, 
are these tool marks uh, the result of a, a purposeful process? Like you are doing everything intentionally? Like when I yeah. see these hash marks where you're building mm -hmm. up this texture with a series of like handmade hash marks, feels very mm -hmm. intentional, very purposeful. While um, sometimes when I see like brush strokes getting kind of smoothed out together in this way that feels a little bit more like a smudge, it, it doesn't feel as like purposeful. It feels kind of like there's some sort of accidental thing happening. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so it, are you using a brush that has some kind of like transfer or like a mixer brush or something? <clears throat> okay. I don't think so. I don't think it does. Oh, weird. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how I managed to spot it if you, you aren't actually even doing that. Um, so. Oh, I did do the the mark on the face like intentionally. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, I'm just like figuring out the planes. I'm like, there's this. Oh, okay. So uh, it's like part of the drawing from underneath. Because I, I see the little uh, crinkles at the corners that look like construction marks. And I love seeing a few construction marks showing through at the edges. Like I can see some of your line work under here. I actually think that's quite appealing. Even in a final painting, having a little bit of that construction work show through, I always find it be mm. very appealing. Um Uh, I, I, it's, it's great. To, I mean, I, I can see the, all the places where you've like been pushing and pulling this thing and spending a lot of time with it. Uh, is there any, pl but I don't have any like canned feedback of things that I say, Hey, I know something that's going to help you right now and help everybody else listening. So I was wondering if you had any questions for me. Oh, uh, I do not. Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> great work. Uh, it's really it's really cool to to see your work for the first time, and um, uh, you know it's it's uh, really flattering to have you spend so much time working on the assignment. I hope that it was educational. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining me on stage. Yeah. All right. Next up is Jim. Brother Cabbage is saying, I love to see the construction marks from discovery phase. This YouTuber calls that artifacting. Yeah, like an artifact is typically like, um, you know, like a leftover that shows like something about the process, whether we're talking about like JPEG artifacting, where we can sort of see the compression or like, uh, I, you know, I'm not actually sure what the dis distinct definition is. Uh, Jim's in the audience with us. Jim, if you want to come on stage, you can raise your hand. Otherwise... Uh, you know, you don't you don't have to if you don't want to come on stage. I, I thought Jim's uh, work here uh, was really great. Uh, he says that the size of jitter brush, uh, liking the size jitter brush more and more. Uh, the context for that is that I've been advocating a little bit. People try out the size jitter brush. This is my personal favorite. This is what I do a lot of my rendering in. You can see the the jitter being like the pressure control is affecting the size of the brush, and. Um, <clears throat> creating a very natural painterly look I find to be easier with this because it works the way that a that a paintbrush does like a paintbrush when you drag just the a little bit is just going to get the tip of the bristles but when you smush it down you get the body of the brush in there and um, you don't get to control how light or dark the paint is coming off your paintbrush right but uh, there's this expectation that like digital painting should be working more like pencil, where like the harder you push, the darker the mark comes out. But I, I don't know. None of that ever made any sense to me. Um, I've always liked working with the size flow brush, uh, and I really like the results that Jim is getting here. Some of the things that I was talking about with the variation in edges, he's getting some um, very cool stylization here. The uh, variation in the sort of artificial variation in the edge that we're seeing like on the back end of the arm here where it's softening up quite a bit. This is not like how it is in the, in the reference, but it doesn't feel like a mistake. It feels like an intentional choice because we have areas where the edge is um, getting very loose and then it's tightening back up again and then it's getting loose again and then it's tightening back up again. Uh, that's called the lost and found edge. It always looks good. It's very good at expressing form. Uh, it's also good at expressing movement or light, uh, there's a lot of ways in which it can express useful information about a subject. 
And so uh, it comes up a lot. Um, and in this case, it really feels like it is showing a bit of the motion here where we have this arm receding back. We don't want the viewer to be paying quite so much attention to how hard of an edge this all is. It does. It's not important that we have like a, a firm, hard edge, like screaming out that like, hey, look at me, I'm an elbow. Who cares? Elbow, like, and so if we want to downplay this a little bit, you can, you know, use the, you know, the painterliness of your marks to be able to downplay those edges, give it a sense of movement, save the attention for more critical parts of the painting where you are using harder edges and higher contrast. And uh, that's exactly the kind of effect that we're getting out of this. Uh, it also looks like he's using a little bit of soft brush or blur in spots. I like to do that uh, early on or sort of midway through the painting to be able to establish some of those larger transitions as well as softer edges early on uh, with an eye to painting over them with the firmer hard edge brush to be able to make high contrast, hard transitions where you end up um, wanting to draw the focus to. So starting with areas which are, are loose and blurry and then moving towards tightness and detail. And uh, that leaves you with this, this nice contrast where some places, like we can see, again, an area with very low amount of interest where we don't really care about what's going on, this you know, just running down the length of the leg, we don't really need to speak on that too much. And so Jim has left it a little bit more vague while uh, more interesting parts like some of the bits on the shoe or the, the hand and the cuff are getting a lot tighter treatment. You don't need to be, there's, I think sometimes when people hear talk like this, they presume that there's a big encyclopedia or like some sort of flow chart where you're like, well, if, the, if there's an elbow and it's headed in this direction, uh, what should it have a hard edge or a soft edge? And the, the truth is that this is not a flow chart. There is not a right and a wrong answer. It's a matter of uh, taste and judgment. If you think that the leg going straight down here is very important, then do the things that make it seem very important. Make it very precise. Make it add in extra layers of detail and subtlety. Add in hard edges. And if you think it is not important, then you can blow it off. You can you intentionally downplay it by blurring edges. You can uh, lower the level of detail. You can lower the level of contrast below what's even in the actual piece. You can fade stuff out and choose to uh, like draw the attention closer towards some other part of the painting and, uh, and completely do that in contrast with what you're seeing in the original reference because, hey, like you should show where your eye is going and what you see inside the image. That's like kind of what we're, we're aiming for here. Like, yes, we want to be able to understand the accuracy of things, but then we also want to skew them towards our own perspective and see our own style in it. And um, making those kinds of choices purposefully is always going to end up creating a slightly better result for the viewer. Uh, and, you know, we learn to do that inside these studies, and then we can carry over those lessons over into our own creative works when we're doing stuff from imagination. Love the idea of making little important versus not important labels and sticking them on. I mean, you can, yeah, you could like, if you are halfway through the thing and you are feeling a little like, uh, I kind of like it, but I don't love it. What do I need to do? You could make a new layer and and just start circling areas and being like, this, this is this needs attention. This doesn't need attention. And like, go through and do a little inventory. Yeah, the um, there's always a mental inventory I have running unlike the areas that I feel like are important that I need to finish in order to call the thing done. There's an inventory on what I find to be unimportant, things I want to skip or blur out or move past. And I'm realizing as I'm teaching more and more that like that mental inventory isn't something I'm always aware of happening. But if you're finding that you need something like that, 
um, take the extra step to add a layer and start making some notes for yourself about what you want to see so that instead of feeling overwhelmed and lost while you're working, you can take a step back and then start to follow the list. Oh, you guys are writing down lectures? Okay, this is also on YouTube, by the way. So feel free to go and look it up on YouTube if you want to go watch the VODs. All these are getting recorded. All right, thanks, Jim. This is awesome work this week. This is just a really great study. All right, call me Cosm. First homework here. We got another first timer. Cosm, if you want to hop on stage, I, I can see you in the in the audience. Feel free to raise your hand. If you don't have a mic or don't want to talk on the mic, that's fine too. Students are studenting. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, isn't it? All right. Um, Cosm, I'm, I feel like this is good. This is the theme for this episode. It's all about edges, right? Cosm is doing a thing, uh, which I was just talking about, hey, it's sometimes really nice to pull out that soft brush in the middle of the process in order to start to like figure out where some of the more broadly light areas are versus the areas that are a little bit more dark and taking, you know, using the soft brush to really like create some of those bigger transitions early on in order to establish the sort of roundness of the figure before we like move in and, and start working on tighter details. Well, um, Cosm is using the soft brush a little bit more later in the process. And I can spot it. I feel like the thing about the soft brush that's peculiar is that when you're up close and you're trying to use it to blend, um, it never feels like it's that soft. And it all feels like it's it's more or less going fine. It's, it's actually kind of hard to spot exactly where you are and exactly where all the marks are landing when they don't leave an edge. And then when you zoom out, you can see the soft brush. You made a mistake in increasing the reference exposure and forgot to readjust those values on the back end. Maybe. I don't think that that's necessarily the issue here. I would say that um, I think you're you're leaning on the soft brush to do blending. And um, I think that is causing your work to have this kind of airbrushy look. There's that iconic airbrushy look that I think everyone recognizes and um, it's very easy to reproduce it digitally using a lot of soft brush for blending. And the alternative to using the soft brush for blending um, is to use a hard brush for blending. I, I guess that, that goes without saying. Um, if this is your first time here, I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo here. The way that you can blend easily with a hard brush is instead of turning down the hardness, what you turn down is the flow. And this way, we get a brush stroke that has a hard edge to it and a soft edge to it. You can see that when the areas where the brush runs, strokes run parallel, we end up with a nice hard edge and where they they run, you know, on, and then on the, the ends of the stroke, we end up with this softer bit. So if you lower your opacity a little bit, and you, you make strokes in the direction that you want to soften, you can very quickly have control over how soft you want to make an area, and you never actually need to use a soft brush to do it. And the advantage of this is that you start to be able to get a lot of control over how, how tight or loose your edges are. So you can make some areas razor sharp, while other areas get a little softer and other areas get totally, totally soft. And we need to have tools that allow us to have those that level of control so that we can start to make folds and, you know, organic shapes like faces and hands feel realistic. Because if you don't have the ability to have like a variety of different edge um edge densities, edge tightnesses, then what you end up with is um, a situation where every edge is either razor sharp or totally blurry. 
and without a lot in between. And that is what I'm seeing in your work is um, you you have a lot. The values seem like they're generally under control. The structure of it is really good. But you are having a lot of trouble controlling um, the in-betweens between totally blurry and soft, like I'm seeing here, and then razor sharp. And it it's like it doesn't actually do it to run one over the top of the other. You can see that in this area here on, along the leg, it's not that the edge gets progressively softer. It's that we have a soft glow over a hard edge. And the alternative to that is to be able to like control where the fall off of that edge is. To be able to you can even make it transition from like a razor sharp edge down to one that is a little bit in between. You can make some of these bits a little bit tighter. So oftentimes with folds, you'll have a one side of it will be relatively tight while the other side will fade out. And this will give you a much more realistic look on things like clothing folds but it'll also help a lot with facial anatomy. There's a lot of very subtle transitions inside faces that um, uh, are the result of being able to control all of this, all of these like micro changes in the edges. And some of it is going to be overt, like you're going to be thinking, oh, that needs to be tighter, that needs to be looser. And some of it is just going to come from the motion of your hand. So you don't need to use my brush. My brush is a really, really simple one. Uh, the whole point of it is that it's really just there to translate the motion of my hand into a nice painterly texture. But if there are brushes that you find you're more comfortable with, um, but still allow you this level of fidelity, this level of control, you can use those. There's a lot to choose from. And typically I find that people are either really good with the size flow or really good with the opacity flow brush, but I would find some version of it with a stiff edge that you can use to do your rendering with so you don't end up with this airbrushy look all over. I can see you typing some. Makes a lot of sense. I will surely try that. I didn't know about your brush. I would love to try it. Yeah, go to huckleberry.art. There's digital resources tab. It's for free to download. I have the world's smallest, smallest brush pack. It's like eight brushes. All of them are either defaults or stolen. Um, but if instead of having to fuss with it, you can just go download my, my stuff. Great. I'm glad that was helpful. That's all the feedback I have for today. I'm, I've got five more minutes. I'm going to go into the assignment. And then if there's any last minute questions, I can take a last minute question or two from anybody in the audience who wants to ask something. All right. So the, um, I'm going to post it in the chat and I'm going to also post it in the homework channel really quick. This is the reference for this week's homework. Um, it's more clouds because, I mean, I, I could, I, I, I could, you know, go a long time without assigning clouds, but uh, I love painting clouds. And so the, um, while the, uh, the big, you know, keyword for today was all about edges, the thing I was thinking about when it came to this reference was rhythm. Uh, one of the things I find to be really appealing about this image is the way in which it has this kind of natural rhythm to it. You know, we've got this chunk here, and then it goes boom, boom, boom. It's got this like beat to it. It's like it builds up, builds up, builds up, and then boom, we get like the big final piece right there. And then underneath that, we have these other smaller variations. Like, uh, man, I'm gonna have to raise the resolution on this. I usually, usually when I do the studies, here's a here's a pro tip, technical tip. I usually actually blow the reference up bigger and just let it like that way I can zoom in a little bit. It'll look like chunky garbage, but at least I won't get that pixel grid. But we can see here all of these little tufts, and they have a certain rhythm to them. Like you can see as it gets further towards the tip, but they're like kind of organized. And then they get more and more chaotic as they get further down. Every single big chunk has smaller chunks. So we get the big chunk, but then it breaks down into smaller chunks as we get towards the edge. We've got 
like medium sized lumps and smaller lumps. And then we got lumps on those lumps. Look, each of these little lumps, this one's actually two lumps smushed together. And then there's like three even micro lumps on top of it. And the great thing about clouds, one of the reasons why they're so appealing to look at is they have this fractal nature. You know, we see these big spiraling arms and poofy chunks, but then on top of each of those, inside this spiraling arm is these other smaller spirals. Look at this. The rhythm of this is so appealing. Inside here, we have this motion, but then coming off that motion, we have these motions. Look at these. So we have like one curl, but we've got curls on top of the curl. And then there's also like a wiggle in the curl. It does this little S curve thing. And so when I'm looking at this, I'm not looking at it in terms of like an absolute block of color. I'm thinking about it in terms of we're not just seeing a solid object. We are seeing the forces acting on that object. We are seeing the wind pattern here. This is not a cloud. This is the wind crystallized in a physical form that we're able to see. This motion that we're seeing up here, this is this is the force of air currents. These, this, this, all this shape here, this is not just a thing which happens to be shaped like an anvil. This is the weight of, this is the, the air pressure pulling things up and then the weight of the water drooping back down and causing the rainfall out of it. When you're seeing an object like clouds or fabric or hair blowing around, you're not, you don't need to look at it as a solid thing having a solid shape. You can look through it and see the dynamic motion underneath. And if you can think and consider the dynamic motion as you're working, the object itself will take form underneath your brush strokes. And it's, it's very satisfying. It's my favorite thing about doing these kind of dynamic organic things like this. And then there's all kinds of beautiful variations in blue. Feel free to play with the colors if you want. But I think that these kinds of, uh, you know, really getting a sense on the rhythm and the feeling, the motion of these sorts of things, it's always, uh, it's always such a joy. And I, I'm hoping that uh, doing a study that's all about that, it'll, it'll bring up, uh, you know, a good experience for all you guys. So um, uh, I hope this, uh, this lecture has been helpful. I love doing these classes with you guys. And um, if anybody has any last minute questions, I can answer a question or two before I let y'all go. Tristan. Just wait for Tristan to come on stage here. Discord is always taking a second for everything to go. Based cloud insurer, yeah. I mean, listen, clouds are probably the best thing to paint. It's not lighting me up. You want to try raising your hand again? I don't know what's going on. I wonder if me and like another mod clicked something at the same time. But also Discord does Discord things all the time. Um... While it's failing to do that, do you want to type it out real quick? My hands are off. <laughs> yeah, Delia did, Delia's not doing anything. I thought uh, something happened before where I thought maybe Dustin and I were, were conflicting clicks. Had issues painting clouds in a study just today, so looking forward to practicing for next week. Great. Great to hear it, St. Ed. Uh, Tristan is saying, yeah, I was struggling a bit with your brush to get the finger details of the hair, and I was wondering if you had tips for that. Oh, finer details. I'm, I'm the worst reader. Finer details with the hair. Um, you know, when it comes to my brush, it's not really, there's not really anything going on here. You know, it really is just the, it's a round brush. It's got some dynamics on it. Um, my strategy for doing hair is to um, try to take it in the big chunks first and focus on it as like bigger, more solid shapes. And then once those are established, zooming in and finding where there is like smaller shapes to break it apart. 
and really try to treat it like a um, treat it in layers, layers of detail, La like uh, like three D models on a in a video game where the closer you get, they swap out the the you know blockier models for more detailed ones. You know, so starting with the the blockiest, furthest, just. Uh, appearance from furthest away and then moving in closer and so it's I don't really necessarily think it's a brush thing I really just think it's a matter of like perspective and then the final step is like you can shrink this brush down and make very fine marks to do like individual little flyaways and stuff and little flyaways those are the things that end up a actually creating a somewhat realistic look to hair overall and so if you try to do hair where you try to group together a thousand little brush strokes running in parallel, you're gonna drive yourself crazy. Yeah, Cloud got that fresh cut. Looking fit. All right, thanks everyone for joining me. Uh, I will see you guys next week. And uh, in the meantime, be good. Have a good one. Bye-bye.